Could you introduce yourself, who you are, and what you are doing? Huh. <laughs> so I'm Kate Wakeling, and I am um, not exactly sure what I am doing now. I you just finished. Uh, uh, I just finished a PhD about Balinese music, and I'm uh, I'm soon to be teaching, lecturing um, in Balinese music. I also work for a publishing company, and I write things like that. I'm Jerome Silsby. Uh, I currently work for uh, Tower Hamlets and Lewisham Music Services doing music workshops in a range of um, ensembles, guitar, African drumming, music tech and tune percussion. Um, I initially came to London to start a PhD in um, looking at how diasporic communities interacted through electronic um, music making technologies. Um, not specific, not not with any particular focus on Indonesia, um, and I've been I was playing for a couple of years with the LSO group, and then for the past about five months or so with Lila Cheetah. What inspired you learning gamelan? How did it start? Oh, for me, it was really um almost like the last thing of a long chain of of association with with Bali. It's slightly strange, so I um. Uh, I heard that there was a travel grant available at my when I was an undergraduate and I really wanted to go somewhere in Asia and I couldn't really decide where and a friend showed me a photograph, a really beautiful photograph of some boats in Indonesia <laughs> and I said that's where I want to go. So I sort of started reading a bit more and um, and sort of discovered there was this very interesting sounding musical culture. Um, so I sort of wrote my proposal and got this grant and um, arrived first of all in Java and travelled around and very much enjoyed listening to things but then I arrived in Bali and had this real jolt of excitement and um, sort of a sense of being very drawn in. Um, but even even then I didn't sort of imagine that I could learn it, it was just something I kind of wanted to hear more of and, and particularly watch the dancing. And so I wrote a um, project for, for my course about it but still not learning anything and then came to SOAS and studied for a master's, still writing about Balinese music but not playing any. And even in fact began a PhD without still feeling like I could play and by then it was almost a kind of embarrassment like why on earth hadn't I tried and um, so I began but it was I felt very shy about it in in London because I feel I'd sort of gone so far in terms of learning about the subject but without any kind of practical capability and so finally came came to Bali again um, to do my field work and felt like I had a bit of sort of anonymity or something and threw myself in and then mm. yeah and then it was great <laughs> then I could really start playing and learning and it was a relief. Um, and then it was nice to come back to London and actually feel like I could sort of join a community here, whereas before I'd felt very um, slightly alien-like, like I was there watching but not taking part. <laughs> and how about uh, you? What, what did it make in learning Gamelan? Where did it come from? Um, I think there's quite a few musicians I know who have, through want of listening to something new and kind of going through into certain genres and maybe feeling that you've kind of got to the limits of where that could take you, you become interested in other, in other genres and in other ways of constructing sound and putting sounds together. Um, a band I was in whilst I was at University of Manchester um, with um, a couple of Japanese guys, one of whom played a, a biwa. Um, and, and he had a lot of kind of traditional Japanese and Chinese and, and kind of Southeast Asian music. So I suppose, I mean, I had a vague idea about what Gamelan was and I think I'd seen a couple of pictures and I think I'd seen the gongs. You seen boats. <laughs> I hadn't seen any boats, but I had seen gongs and, and without really... It's funny, I think, sometimes that a symbol can, can carry so much appeal and can really speak to a person, even though that you don't really understand what that symbol represents until you start to make that journey into, you know, unpicking what what that kind of is, is representing, you know, the world which it, in which it inhabits kind of thing. And, um, yeah, and then was just looking for an opportunity to play Gamelan, and then whilst I was doing a, a Masters in Music in Newcastle, um, this was having been away for about 15 months, spending most of that time living and working in Asia, so I'd, I'd, been, I'd been working in China, and I'd, 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 um, I'd start to learn Gujeng, there and then I'd been in J Japan and I'd, I'd started to learn a bit of shamisen um, but was playing it too much like a guitar 
Um, barcodes. <laughs> not quite barcodes, but just you, 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 the aesthetic of it, you need to really keep your fingers together. Um, and I think just as a guitarist, you automatically think I can just play that note by kind of stretching here or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think there was always a, a kind of um, this feeling of wanting to, to kind of, you know, understand alter, alternative kind of cultural um, approaches to life through the way that music has been imagined in those places. And then it was just um, initially... I, um, there was, a, sorry, it's just been, a, it's just been quite a long day, I'm just kind of <laughs> going through the filing cabinet. Imagine the gong. Imagine the gong, yes, yes, that brings <laughs> me back, everything comes back to the gong, doesn't it, yeah. Um, yeah, there was an advert up, um, of somebody wanted to set up a Javanese group at the Oriental Museum in Durham, oh, wow. and, um, and I was quite excited by that, because, you know, for a couple of years I've been looking for the opportunity to play gamelan. And um, I, I emailed the guy who was organising it, Paul Fletcher, and I think two people had responded. And so I put a, a, a sign up around the, the music department just to kind of try and get people encouraged and then just random people I would speak to, I would try and get them interested in, in kind of joining up. I think we got to about six, but it wasn't quite the critical mass. Right. So it didn't happen that time. And then the term afterwards, the, the, he tried to kind of get it started again after New Year, thinking about people's New Year's resolutions and things. And um, yeah, I kind of did a bit of propaganda again, uh, maybe a few pictures of gongs and boats or something. And, <laughs> yeah, then, uh, right and then there was enough, there were 12 of us, but this was, this was still a very mini group. Um, and so we played that for you know, a couple of terms while I was there. And then when I moved down to London, initially I didn't have, any, I didn't have enough spare time to play Gamelan. Um, and then I just heard about the LSO group and I'd, I'd, I'd wanted to kind of come along, but I'd, I'd usually been working and then I had a change of work situation. I started doing the music workshop, so I, was, I had more evenings free. Um, so, so then started going al going along to the LSO, LSO group. Um, and then in terms of the the Javanese, it's interesting how when you when your first kind of port of call of something, um, well, initially it obviously defines that uh, experience, that phenomenon for you, because it's if it's the only version of something you've seen, it's all you know. You know, like your parents or your brothers and sisters or um, the first plate of a certain dish you've ever had. If, you know, right. if, if it's new to your experience. To right, right, right. And, um, and, then come, and then going along and playing with the South Bank Gamelan players for, um, I think, about just over a year ago. And, and seeing and experiencing Javanese Gamelan with about 30 people. With the <laughs> being singers. Being played really and, well. <laughs> being played really well and with the singers and Rabab and everything. And suddenly you're on this cloud and you're kind of... Wow, actually, sorry, I should, I, should, I should kind of structure this a bit, because from going, from doing Javanese with a very small group, where there was only about eight or, no, sorry, there were 12, weren't there? Um, but then that varied, you know, sometimes between eight and 12, depending on who turned up. And then coming down and then starting Balinese Gamelan, suddenly this was, I'd really love Javanese Gamelan, but suddenly Balinese Gamelan was like, wow, this is so much more kind of impressive on, on all sorts of levels and it's more complex and more intricate than what we had been doing in that group previously. Not to take anything away from that group or the experience of playing with that group. Um, and I think at that point I had this, you know, Balinese Gamelan and Javanese Gamelan were kind of weighted uh, <laughs> kind of more heavily in favour of Balinese Gamelan. But then, yeah, the, the, play, the experience... The of, chart, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. The... Um, the experience of being in um, just kind of that, that one day of the afternoon, just playing with the Javanese kind of gamelan players, suddenly gave me this different, um, just completely different uh, understanding about what Javanese gamelan was and seeing it and experiencing it and, and feeling it in the proper context. Well, when I say proper, um, rather it was just the context was reframed from what I'd previously how I previously constructed it as, or how it had previously been constructed in my mind based on the experience of playing with that other group. Is your group still with the eight or twelve yeah. people? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're still, still, it's still going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they sometimes come, like, they came down. And that was one of the reasons why I've gone along to, the, to, the, to the South Bank Does the group one. have a name? 
<laughs> I'm not sure, but it, they're, they're it looks like he yeah, yeah. developed the group. Yeah. No, I didn't develop the group. No, the, it was there was a guy Paul Fletcher who had who had been in solo for a couple of months who uh, who set the group up. Where did they get the instruments from? Was it you said it was Durham? No. Yeah, Durham, and yeah, it was okay, just at the Oriental Durham. Museum. So, oh. who's it? It's not, there's no one at Durham, but there's someone at Leeds, isn't it? Isn't there is Neil, someone at Durham. There is. And there's someone at York, Neil Sorrell. But York, yeah. York, Neil Sorrell, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess, do they, no, it's too far for them to use. No, they it? have their own. Yeah, Sorry, of course, well, yeah, yeah. Be, I think so. So, well, the group is still running. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and sometimes, and they've come along, you know, they've made the trip down from Newcastle a couple of times, um, I think, to go to the South Bank. Right. And, and, there, and now there's, there's a, a mix of players, some of whom just... Somehow they came across it and it seemed interesting to them. Uh, there's, there's a Javanese woman I know who's, uh, who, who who now lives in South Shields I think and has a family there and then so, obviously that was a great opportunity for her to kind of, maintain the connection. Actually, this friend of mine she'd never actually played. I don't think she'd played. She'd possibly tried, but she'd never played much, Javanese gamelan while she was in Java. Right. And I think she's actually playing more Javanese gamelan now in Durham than she had. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so you said um, you were a musician before you joined the Balinese gamelan. Yeah. Yeah. Already to be. <laughs> and you yeah. also were, you were playing. Yeah, I played the flute a lot, um, and um, I think that was one of the things that made it quite a an initially sort of uncertain transition into becoming a kind of committed member of the group. Because I, I think I I did go before I went to Bali. I I went for a term to the um, LSO group, which I really enjoyed, but it felt quite a Weirdly, it felt like very hard to give that time. I felt like it was quite, I had to really make an effort and it seemed like things would always come in the way and I'd have to try and change them. And it's strange how coming back from Bali, that, that just didn't exist. Maybe I had less to do. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was interesting that it seemed like a, not um, not an invasion, but a, it seemed very complicated to suddenly find this time for this completely separate thing. Yeah, so that my, my friends were mainly musicians, but they were involved in classical music in, in London and quite a different sort of arrangement and things that involve perhaps very intense work with a one group of people and then and then it's different so it's um, a different kind of schedule and it not that I was necessarily I was studying at that time so but but I think because socially I was sort of involved in that it felt quite weird to to sort of join this club <laughs> I guess it was more of a priority once you possibly yeah back and I think I was yeah and there was this sort of self-consciousness about I'd already written so many essays about Balinese music and I sort of had this kind of um, but it's strange because my PhD ended up being about a kind of um, disjuncture between ideas of theory and practice and how really practice is the important thing. And yeah, I guess I And you were feeling to, that. And had to work that out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't have to stay with the theory writing up the PhD. But <laughs> mm. 